the dream of a power Z feed at my fingertips. Does it work? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. Well, I finally hit my limit on cranking the head on my mill up and down for every tool change and every drill length, and I'm going to install the Priest Tools Power Z Feed Kit. This is a kit that Greg over at Priest Tools sent me for free, so full disclosure on that, but I am going to show you how to install it and give you my honest review of it. So let's go. Here's the kit as I received it. So I'll do what the kids today call a deboxification video. I'm pretty in touch with the youth of today. You probably didn't know that that was a genre of video popular on SnapTalk and TickChat. So here on the deboxification, we find the instructions and let's see, we've got an electrical box and a line cord there, AC line cord, some conduit. And this looks like a switching DC power supply. So the motor is probably low voltage DC. It's a standard unit there. It's a nice switch plate. And this is the enclosure. And we've got some bags of bits and bobs inside. And then we got the switch there. Ah, here's the good stuff. This is the actual motor. It's a small DC motor with an integrated gearbox. And then we got a bunch of uh, nuts and bolts and paraphernalia. And there's a rubber spider shaft coupler there. You always want to see that on a power drive system like this. There's the kit in its entirety. Well packaged and pretty straightforward. The instructions are two sheets, double-sided, so I think we can uh, tackle this. Step one is to figure out, is it going to fit? So it sits on top of the column in the back here, and actually it's lower than the head is when the head is all the way up. So the head on my mill is about three quarters of the way up here, so vertical clearance, no problem. I'm going to get the sheet metal cover off the motor here. It's going to be kind of in the way for the install. So the first thing we do is pull off the factory column cover here. And I have no idea why that bolt has a washer on it and none of the other ones do. You'll have to ask China, I guess. This is a very straightforward mechanism, as you can see. It's just two bevel gears, one on the crank and one on the column lead screw there. And there's some mystery grease on there that I will freshen up while we're in here. Next step is to remove the nylock nut that's on the lower bevel gear there. So you hold the hand wheel to keep it from turning and then just loosen that. It's not very tight because it really doesn't need to be. It's just to keep the birds from stealing that gear. Ah, get ah. on. My biggest concern here is dropping that nut down the bottom of the column because I have no idea how I would ever get it out if that happened. So I've got a magnet there to just kind of keep it in place as I fish it out of there. And well, turns out the nut is stainless anyway and the magnet was just decorative, but eh, at least I didn't drop it. So I'll clean out some of the old grease in there. There's one factory washer down there, and then the kit comes with two extras and a wave washer to lock things together. So you put those down on top, and then that spider shaft coupler that I showed earlier separates, and you put the lower part down in place of the M12 nut that was on there. And then the wave washer will lock it in place since it's not nylock like the nut was. There's also a set screw in there, but I'm not going to tighten that because it's just going to jack up the threads on my lead screw for no good reason, I think. To tighten that down, I just used a scrap of bar stock and some pliers to snug it down all the way. It's pretty easy to tell when it's tight. It just kind of stops at the bottom, and then that wave washer will lock it all together so it won't loosen. That's looking pretty good. Everything turns. Back to the bench now. The motor gets attached to this plate, but the plate does not look like the photo. This is a common problem with small run kits like this, is that the photos and the instructions are made from the prototype. And uh, this plate has about 20 extra holes in it that aren't necessary for this kit. Presumably they're used with other kits or other mills, not sure. The instructions also specify six bolts for the motor. There's actually only four, but you know, again, small run kits, you got to expect little quirks like this. So I managed to figure out which holes are supposed to be used for the motor and took a little bit of thinking to figure out which way it would go up on this plate. The other thing that uh, tripped me up is that the holes in the motor are threaded, but you're not supposed to use them as threaded holes. They're actually being used as clearance holes here. And then the plate is threaded. And then there's little washers that go under those cap screws. So uh, a few little uh, adventures there. And you know, I don't fault small kits for this. It's hard for a uh, small company to keep instructions like this updated. Writing good instructions is a lot of work. If you've never done any technical writing, you may not appreciate how difficult it is to write really good instructions and to maintain them over time. Next up, the instructions show a plastic spacer, which also isn't really matching what's in the kit, but there are these blue 
horseshoe shim things, which are presumably the same thing. And uh, that's easy enough to figure out. And actually, this is a really nice idea. I like it when kits do stuff like this. It's a really easy and foolproof way to set the spacing on the other end of the shaft coupler, which otherwise might be pretty tricky to do. So you just put the spacers on there, you shove the coupler down up against them, you tighten the set screw on that coupler, you slide the shims back out, Bob's your uncle, that's gonna work every time. It's a really nice idea. Before I put the motor back on, I'm gonna throw some new grease on there. This is wheel bearing grease, kind of my go-to if in doubt on gears like this that will never see the light of day so they can't be oiled. Then throw some of this grease on there. Eh, it's good stuff. Smells like the devil's toothpaste, but it's good stuff. Now I can set the motor on there, which the instructions make sound like quite a tricky process, but honestly I found it really easy. Just rotate it until the dogs line up and then you can use the hand wheel to crank the whole assembly into position to line up the bolt holes and then install the same bolts that were used to hold that uh, cover on. Now a little test run, it's certainly engaging. You are now cranking against the motor though, so you can still crank by hand, but it's noticeably stiffer now. Power supply then mounts behind it. A little bit of a guess which holes to use again, but I do like that this kit is using a modern switching power supply instead of the analog clunky rectifier silliness that's in the x-axis power feed on this mill. The control panel now mounts on the front. You remove a couple of the trim panel screws and the instructions do say the holes may not line up depending on the production date of your mill. In my case, they do line up though, so that's nice. And that panel is super sturdy, which I really like. I can shake the whole mill with it. There's nothing worse than a flimsy control panel that flexes when you operate the controls and it doesn't interfere with anything else on the control panel. Back to the bench now to prepare the switch box. This appears to be an off-the-shelf electrical box, and there's some standard Romex cable clamps here. So I fish the wiring for the switch through one of the cable clamps and into the box. It's kind of a close fit, but it does work. And then I can attach the clamp there, fish the wiring through, and then the switch goes into the other end of the box. The switch is quite nice. It's a single pole, double throw momentary. So you just push it up or push it down and release and the motor stops. That's a, a nice design for this control, I think. Let's see if the electrical box will fit on the panel now. In principle, it should slide right in, but the box won't sit flush against the mill's electrical box. And a quick inspection reveals that the bolts on the cable clamp are too long. So, well, I suppose there's lots of clever, fancy ways you could fix that involving dismantling the clamp and files or putting them in the lathe or whatever. Or you can hold them up to the bench grinder, being careful not to touch the plastic box, and I'm using my thumb on the back of the bolt so I know if it gets too hot and is in danger of melting the cable. Look, you do it your way, I'm going to do it my way. You could also flip that cable clamp around the other way, but that means then you'd have to remove the entire electrical box if you ever want to adjust the slack in that cable or remove the switch or anything like that, which is kind of annoying. And now the box sits flush. Let's see how well those holes line up. I kind of don't expect them to because there's a lot of variables here that all have to come together for those holes to line up. And well, yeah, they don't. Not great anyway. The top one kind of lines up. It's sort of close. Screw is a little crooked, but it might go in. I'll loosen the panel there to give it a little wiggle room maybe. That almost worked for the top, but the bottom one's kind of not even close. So I'm gonna have to open those up, I think. I went through my drills till I found one that was a very close fit on the hole, and then I went up 10 thou, and I'll drill those out. Test fit number two, and nope, up another 10 thou on the drill sizes. And test fit number three, and that is just barely enough. So I was able to get the bottom screw in a little bit crooked, and then the top screw went in perfectly fine. And then I snugged up the panel bolts and Bob's your uncle. It's certainly solid. That'll do. All right, the switch plate goes on next and that indicates up and down, of course. And it's keyed to the switch, which is nice. And then there's a nut that goes on there. The switch also came with a knurled ring if you prefer to use that. You use the knurled ring if you want the switch to come loose every 21 days and then the nut if you want it to actually stay tight. That's the rule for those. And then we can put that cover back on. The next step is kind of the weirdest. You have to fish all the cables through the enclosure that goes over everything on top of the mill. 
but you can't actually install it yet because you have to connect the wiring. So I think I would have rather seen like a slotted grommet or something here. So you can do the wiring first and then slide the cover over when you're done because this also makes servicing this thing a little tricky. But the electrical connections themselves are very easy. There's a diagram in the kit. There's the low voltage outputs that go to the switch. The pins on the motor are marked. One of them has a red dot on it. The instructions tell you which wire to put where, so that's handy enough. And those are crimp connectors that just slide right onto the motor. One of the things I like about this kit is that the whole thing is very easily reversible and these electrical connections are more evidence of that. This whole kit could be stripped off in 20 minutes if you decide you don't like it. And then the AC line cord goes on to the high voltage input side of the power supply. You've got line neutral and earth ground there. And it comes with this nice little insulating cover, which is a nice touch. Those wiring harnesses are well made as well. Everything's heat shrinked and strain relieved. Now you gotta kind of fish everything through and slide the cover in place, which is again, kind of why I'd rather just see a slotted hole in this cover, but you can finagle it on there. And then you put the screws in on the sides and then tighten down the cable clamp. Okay, let's plug this thing in and give it a test run. Make sure the locks are free, and here we go. Oh, okay, it moves. It's very, very fast and very, very loud. So that's not my favorite thing here. Quite a bit faster going down, of course, because of gravity. And the mill actually shakes quite a lot on the way down. So let's see what we can do about the noise. I cut the cardboard box that it came in apart, and I'll just uh, tape that around there for some damping, see if that helps. And I'm also gonna snug up the screws here if I can. That metal box is kind of acting like a giant tweeter. It's really resonating the sound, I think. But I can't get the cover tight. Even with the screws all the way in, you can see that it's still loose. So the screws are bottoming out in there. I'll need to address that. Let's see if that helped with the noise. And well, it's maybe 20% better. Maybe I'm imagining that. But you can see how violently the mill shakes on the way down. And the thing is, it doesn't need to move this fast. Like it's almost like rapid feed fast and it doesn't need to be. All I really need it to do is save me the hassle of cranking. And you can still crank by hand, but you are fighting the motor and it's definitely noticeably less pleasant than it was before this kit. So I think I can tackle both of those problems at once by simply lowering the voltage on the motor. These switching power supplies always have an output adjustment on them. So you can see here it's 12 volts right now. So I'll just hold the meter on there and get my screwdriver on the adjustment pot. The adjustment pot will always be the one that you can see basically on these things. And I'll just turn that down a couple of volts and see how that does. Cause that will slow down the motor and make it quieter. Both of which I would like. And after that, yeah, it's slower and much quieter now. It's still loud, but it's not ear splitting. It's about as loud as the rapid feed on my X axis now. I went in one more time, tried to turn it down further, but it bottoms out at 9.9 .9 volts. With the voltage down as low as it'll go, it's still faster than necessary uh, and louder than I would like, but I think this is probably livable. But on the lower voltage, the mill doesn't shake on the way down now, which is a big improvement. It's slowing it down just a little bit is what it needed for that. Just for giggles, I figured I'll take one more shot at sound deadening. On the junk pile, I found this piece of cork. So I thought, well, what the heck, I'll stick some of this on that box and see if it helps. So I measured and cut some chunks of this to fit around the metal enclosure. That metal enclosure is also folded sheet metal that has not been welded up, so the sides of it kind of vibrate. I think there's a lot of things working against this thing acoustically. Over to my Precision Machinist's hot glue gun now. And I'll get some of this on there and just stick these pieces of cork. The whole thing with sound deadening is that the entire surface of the deadening material has to be bonded to the thing that you're trying to kill the sound on. If you've ever tried to remove sound deadening from a car, you know how important and how maddening that is. I also shortened those bolts on the bench grinder so that the cover is now tight. There's a gap there because I mismeasured the front piece because of course I freaking did. So I'll just shove a sliver of extra material in there. This is why I like metalworking. But hey, that repair is seamless. No one will ever know. And yeah, honestly, I don't know if that helped. I'm going to tell myself that it did because it was a bunch of extra work, but I honestly don't know that it did. The thermal venting on that box is on the top and I didn't want to cover that obviously, so that's why I only wrapped the sides. 
Here you can see how fast that hand wheel is spinning and really it doesn't need to be that fast. If it was the same speed as hand cranking but I didn't have to hand crank it, I would be happy with that. At this point you might be tempted to think, well this kit is a little disappointing. But here's the thing about small run kits from small companies. They're made by hardworking smart people who are trying to make a good thing just like you. So you gotta work with people a little bit. So I reached out to Greg and I was like, hey, this thing is kind of loud and it vibrates quite a bit. And he was like, oh, that's weird, shouldn't do that. I'll send you a new motor. So he did, and I installed it, and night and day. This thing is now quiet and smooth, and the speed is just right, and it's an absolute dream. So it seems like I just had a bad motor. In fact, I noticed that the seal on the motor shaft is leaking, and there was oil around one corner of the case when I took it apart. So I suspect that it's just leaking and the gearbox is probably running dry, which is why it was so loud and why it was so hard to crank against by hand. The new motor is much nicer in all those regards. I like this speed here. I did actually turn the voltage back up a little bit, but not all the way up to 12. If you want it faster, you could turn it back up. A fun next step would be to add an additional voltage divider. Just below the switch, a little potentiometer would be easy to add there. It's all low voltage at that point and uh, that would allow me to control the speed and potentially use it as a power down feed. I don't know if the motor has enough oomph for that, but it's worth a try. Anyway, this was a really easy kit to install. It's fully reversible if you don't like it. I think overall I'm happy with this kit and uh, give it a try if you're interested in uh, not having to crank your column anymore. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.